On this episode of American Grindstone, we're going to sit down with my buddy Chu, an illustrator, a tattooist, and a biker with some really colorful stories and sage advice. Check it out. The Grindstone. My sonny boy kept his nose to the grindstone. Never give up. Never surrender. Woo! Okay. Hey. I'm good without this. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> You just threw away all your notes. I yeah. threw away the notes, baby. Uh, I didn't even bring any notes. That was just a, that was a flex, just to. Oh, we're, yeah. we're doing this. Yeah. We're doing it live. Just right. a sweat. Just the goes notes down. The notes are in my heart. <laughs> the notes are. The camera <laughs> zooms up on. Yeah. <laughs> just one the, the, the pupils going. <laughs> the, one, the one Will Smith yeah. drop. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. I like I like where we're going with this we're already. Started, man. Are we started? No. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Chu, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you, it. You um, are one of my favorite people. Um, Thank you. You've been, we've been, been in my life for about a year and a half. Um, you've done all of my tattoos, minus one. Mm-hmm. Um, I never wanted color tattoos in my life until I saw your color work, and then I was like, that's all I want. That's all I want. Uh, so I'm... I'm his canvas. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> we won't go as far as saying I'm your muse. We'll let that be your wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. But, um, man, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, you uh, have got quite a life story. You've got a lot going on in your life um, from owning uh, tattoo shops and other businesses to just the art that you do on the side and a lot of graphic design work, I would say, or illustration work. Mm-hmm. Um but I'm just glad to have you here, and I'm thankful that you took some time for us. And uh, I'm going to say, I want to start by saying, tell us a little bit about your life growing up a little bit. I think, mm-hmm. you know, you started doing art at a very young age, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you also started doing art in people's bodies at a very young age. And so I kind of want to jump into that a little bit. Okay. Oh, man. Where do I start, really? Montana. <laughs> Montana. Well, it starts a little bit before that as far as tattooing goes. As far as art goes, my Uncle Ray was an artist, and um, he's uh, like one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't know that as a kid growing up, you Mm -hmm. know, but uh, I do do know that now. Um, My grandfather used to take me every other Saturday to go get my hair cut. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. And so uh, a little ways down from this barber shop, uh, was a tattoo shop. It was Dennis Dwyer's tattoo shop. It was called Tattoo You. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like seven-year-old kid looking inside the windows of this tattoo shop, you know, and you're seeing everything in there, you know, skulls and daggers and motorcycles and naked ladies all and the cool all stuff. the cool all stuff the cool when stuff. you're seven, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know. <laughs> and I'm reading comic books, and I'm looking at the artwork on the wall, and I'm like, this is like comic book stuff. I don't really understand what I'm looking at. Yeah. I don't know that they're tattoos. Gotcha. Like I'm seven, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. The, the, yeah, you don't understand. Like that's the permanent ink. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at these, you know. I'm looking at flash on the walls is what they call it. And so um, one day we rolled up there, and it was a little bit later in the day, and there was all these choppers out front. All these bikes were out front. And I start going, and I look at all these bikes, man, and they, you know, the smell of oil and fuel and, and and the paint and the metal and just just the whole vibe is there. I don't even know what I'm looking at. But I do know that those motorcycles are cool. Yeah. And I have been riding motorcycles. You know, we're, we're, we're from the desert, and so we got dirt bikes and uh-huh. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So anyways, I'm looking at these choppers, and then the sound of a tattoo machine catches my ear, man, and the door is open, and music, and I walk inside this tattoo shop, and I'm there, man. Yeah. You know? Immersed. Like I'm touching the flash. Like I smell pine saw, oh. and I'm there. You know? Yeah. Seven years old. Yeah. Seven, eight, something mm-hmm. like that. And, uh, man, so now I'm just looking at all this flash, man. You know? I'm looking at the naked ladies and the skulls and the daggers and all this stuff, and I'm just lost in it, you know? And then, boom! <laughs> he totally jumped. So loud. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Hey, kid, what the f*** are you doing in here? You can't be in here. Yeah. Get the hell out of here, you know? Yeah. 
And I'm just froze there, man. It's this big old biker dude, and he's just looking at me, <laughs> you know? And I'm just stunned, man. I'm just like, what the hell? Yeah. And then a couple other faces, you know, look look from behind him, you know, and they're looking at me, and they're laughing at me, and I run out of the tattoo shop. And I'm just tripping. Uh-huh. But I knew it was cool. Mm-hmm. You know? I didn't know what it was, but I knew I was in a, a place that was cool. And that was it, man. I went in. I told my grandfather, but my grandfather was, you know, I'm just a, a young kid. You know, he's like, whatever. I get my hair cut, and I go back outside, and those guys are out there. Mm-hmm. And they're going to go start their bikes. And I look. Well, I remember looking at the choppers, and I remember seeing uh, a sticker on one of the choppers that said, the Dirty Dozen with dice and spider webs, and it was a motorcycle club. But I didn't even know what motorcycle club was. Mm -hmm. And then I look at these guys starting the bikes, you know, and they're all in blue jeans. And I mean, these guys were cool, man. Yeah. And they were wearing patches that said the Dirty Dozen, Arizona on the bottom. And that's how that started, man. Wow. Ever since then, I just knew that those two things were the things that I wanted to do. Wow. No, I, I can totally relate with that. Just seeing that club, want to be a part of that club, be a, be a part of also something where you can't be here. Get out of here, kid. You're like, why? Yeah. That's like, what, yeah. It's just so much more alluring. Right, right. Like, right. Second, what's behind the curtain? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And uh, every time I go to Tucson, I, I go by and I say hi to Dennis. He's still alive and tattooing. In the uh-huh. same shop? No, no, gotcha. he's down on Alvernon now. I think that shop was on Grant a long time ago in Tucson. Um, but that was it. And uh, like I said, I think I was about seven by the time I was 15. I started my first shop. That's crazy. Did you 15. start drawing right then and there? I, I was already drawing. Gotcha. Because I used to watch my Uncle Ray draw all the time, and so I'd grab a, a pen or a pencil, and I would just draw. Yeah, you know Sesame Street stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what do you know when you're five? You know yeah. what I mean. I want to <laughs> draw some Ernie and you. Bert or something. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Actually, what I did draw a lot was is I used to create. I used to collect those uh, those uh, monster cards and stickers that Big Daddy Roth used to have out. Oh, you know yeah. who he is? I'll, yep. Yeah. Big Roth man. Yeah. He's so Rat Fink and okay. yeah, gotcha. Rat gotcha. Fink and. All those things, man. But I got I got a lot of that stuff from my cousin Ricky, and he was into trucks and hot rods. He was older than me. Yeah. And uh, that was the first motorcycle that I rode. He had, like, some Harley Davidson 125, like, dirt bike back in the day. So that's what I grew up riding. Just a cool cousin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It always you is. know, it going always through is. the desert on dirt roads, you know, and uh-huh. just no helmet on and shorts. Yeah. 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 It's 99 <laughs> degrees out, dude. Oh, hey, yeah. yeah. I'm the yeah. part of the dude yeah. he does it. We're not, we're not here, bro. <laughs> you know, parents are lifting up their cores, you know. It's yeah. Like, ah, he's fine. You know. They see you out there. Yeah. They see you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you start drawing. You're seven. You have this amazing experience. Eight years later, seven years later, you're t- drawing on people's bodies. How does... Yeah. Tell I me about know. that. Like, how do you go from being in the shop... To like, when did you get your first machine and when did you start yeah. messing around with that? Right after, uh, well, some of the story gets a little sad. I don't want to dive too deep into that. But my grandmother passes away and then my whole family structure kind of just mm-hmm. goes away. My grandmother was the person that really kept us all together. And um, my mother married a guy, a Vietnam vet, and... Uh, and he just wasn't very nice to be around. Yeah. So I left home when I was young. Um, I just didn't want to put up with it. Yeah. You know. Um, from that, man, I just was um, looking at everything that everyone, all the artwork and everything that everyone had around them, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, it was pretty much a bunch of... Um, Mexican artwork, Chicano artwork, they called it back in the day, from the lowrider culture, yeah, nice, right? Nice. So I'm down in Tucson. So everyone's got what they call like cholos or cholas and, uh, you know, old pachucos and lowriders and all these prison type themes and yeah. stuff like that. And all these guys are getting these tattoos. And so, um, man, there was this kid named Junior that taught me how to make a tattoo machine. 
a prison tattoo machine. Oh, that's so awesome. Right? Yeah. I've seen one of those once in person. I'm like, this is amazing. I want to know how to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. So, you know, man, we make this machine. And at first, I, I, I it's covered up now, but my first tattoo I did on myself, I was 11, and I just did this cross right here. Right? Yeah. The day after that, I did a mom heart over here. Oh, wow. I'm 11. Yeah. <laughs> but then, <clears throat> check this out. The, ni- the <laughs> night that I did the cross, I go to the dinner table. My mom made spaghetti, right? And so I go to reach for some bread. <laughs> and her husband, you know, the old man goes, what's that? What's that on your hand? He didn't say it nicely, you know, but he's <laughs> like, yeah. what's that on your hand, you know? Go to the bathroom, wash that shit off. So I go to the bathroom, I pretend to wash it off, but it don't wash off. Yeah. So for the rest of the dinner, I'm like <laughs> eating spaghetti, spaghetti like yeah. this, you know what I mean? And so, and he totally, but then I went to go reach for bread again and he saw it again. Yeah. Woo. He whipped my ass. Man. Oh, buddy. Yeah. He whipped it. Yeah. Whipped it good. Wow. So the next day I went out and I gave myself another tattoo. Yeah. yeah. Mom. Yeah, mom. Yeah. Because yeah, she didn't whip my ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the day after that, I tattooed my friend Danny King. And um, and it just started, man. It uh. just, it was just there. So by the time I left home, and uh, there's a much bigger story that goes with that, but by the time I left home and I landed in a place where I could kind of like just be myself, um, you know, I built another tattoo machine, and now I'm tattooing these guys that are kind of taking care of me in a sense. Huh. I got with a lady that was a little bit older than me, and we moved to Montana. Hmm. And uh, she already had a daughter, and we moved to Montana, and uh, I'm 15, man. No one's going to hire me. Yeah. Wow. But you do have your art, right? So you're like, maybe I make money off of this. Is that how that kind yeah. of? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the only way I made money. Yeah. You know? So, uh, anyways, there was this book. I don't even know if you can get it anymore, but it was called um, Tattooing from A to Z from Spalding and Rogers. Spalding and Rogers is a tattoo supply company from Voorheesville, New York. They're still around. <clears throat> the founders are dead, though. So it was Tattooing from A to Z, and in there was, like, how to build a shop, how to mix pigments, how to clean your needles, how to do this, how nice. to do all that. And I had this book. So I made a tattoo shop. Wow. And I just started <laughs> tattooing people. Wow. And, um, you know, ironically enough, the people that came and got tattooed by me in 1983 were blue collar workers and bikers. Yeah. And so, once again, here's the biker element with me. Yeah. You know, and they're feeding me. You know, I'm taking care of my family. In 1983, yeah. I was making about $200 a day. And minimum buckets. wage was about two fifty. Yeah, an Jeez, hour. You're doing all right, though. I was doing good. Yeah. I was taking care of my family. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, and so um, that was it, man. I I tattoo all these bikers and and their women and and uh, by this time I'm already grown up. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a typical fifteen year old. Even mm-hmm. though I think that fifteen year olds back in my day were already so much stronger and Agreed. and i mean these drive around with with guns in the back of their yeah, trucks in their yeah. trucks yeah. yeah you know let's get out let, we'll get out of school and we'll go shoot some mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah yeah so um uh, 15 year olds were definitely different yeah in my time for sure you know but uh <clears throat> yeah man so i'm tattooing all these uh these bikers and the more I'm tattooing them, the more I'm finding out about that culture and they're literally taking care of me. Mm-hmm. And then patch holders start coming to my shop. And what, what I, what's patch? Holders? So a patch holder is a club member. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, you got your regular citizen bikers, gotcha. you know, yes. just regular people riding Harley Davidson's mm-hmm. or whatever. And then you got, uh, club members and they're called patch holders. So, um, so patch holders started coming to my shop and I started tattooing them and I didn't understand the difference until it, it was explained to me. Mm, yeah. And, um, so you want to hear the story? 
Yeah. Oh, yes. The first chopper story? I want to hear your first chopper. It's one of my favorite <laughs> stories. I want to hear the whole, oh, you the hear? whole story. Yeah, okay. Life. It's one of my favorite uh, stories. And when I reached out to you, I said, this is one story you got to tell when okay. you go. American Grindstone is brought to you by Travax, the ultimate gear for the modern adventurer. Whether you're hitting the trails, exploring the city, or just navigating everyday life, Travax has you covered. Here is the Contour. It's my own personal everyday carry. The Contour is Travax's sleek and durable wallet that is designed to be your EDC companion. Made from top grain leather and precision engineered metal, the Contour not only looks great, but is built to withstand whatever life throws at you. But that's not all. Travax also offers a wide range of rugged belts, their skeletonized field knife, and the ever popular OG 2.0 as well as other essentials that blend form and function seamlessly. Elevate your everyday carry with Travax, where style meets durability. Travax, earn your story. So uh, I'm living in Missoula, Montana. I got a shop, and I'm with, a, and I'm with an older lady. And, um, you know, I'm tattooing these bikers. And um, I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. And they treat me really well. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, they're helping me take care of my family by doing just what I do. And um, so about once or twice a month, there was this guy named George Rote, and he lived in a trailer park towards the outside of town with about 80 to 90% of all these people that I'm tattooing. Wow. All right. All these bikers. And... um he used to have a party and I'd go there and I would, and I would party and I would tattoo, you know, a tattoo party. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. all these bikes and it's this trailer, this trailer park is kind of, you get off the road and it's kind of like in a C shape here. And so there's a row of trailers here, you know, there's a driveway, there's a place for a bomb fire. And then there's another row behind that of trailers. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, like I said, I'm used to going over there and all that kind of stuff, but now I want a bike. Because yeah. I want to be like these guys. You want to be in the club. Right? Yeah. And so now it's stemming from like when I was seven. Yes. Right? <laughs> totally. And so I go out, man, and and I think I'm I'm the shit, you know. So I go out here and I buy this Honda CB 4, 400, 450 or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's 1983, man. And so the word like no Jap crap is everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. American yeah. made, you know, yeah. so it's like we don't want no Hondas. We don't want any of that stuff. So anyways, I buy a Honda. And, you know, and I go get me a pair of engineer boots and a leather jacket, you know. And uh, I already know these guys, so I, I go get me some booze and my tattoo gear. And I'm set up, man. Like, I'm feeling good. Yeah, yeah. You know? I'm doing the Lord's work out here. <laughs> man, I'm feeling good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm full of myself. You know? Yeah. Like, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to roll into this party. And these guys are going to see me on this bike. And they're going to be like, yeah. This kid's the... <laughs> so I go roll up. And there's about 30 bikes there already. Yeah. And uh, as I pull up, man, the bonfire is going and stuff. And as I pull up, everyone's kind of looking at me like this. You know, eyes wide open. A couple of them are, like, shaking their heads. Like, what the hell is this? And I'm thinking, yeah, I got him, man. Speechless. You know what I They're mean? Speechless. Yeah. Yeah. A prodigal son, you yeah. know? Totally. <laughs> so anyways, man, I get off the bike, and this huge man comes over. His name's uh, Brett. Comes over and grabs my bike and rolls it right into the bonfire. <laughs> How much did this cost you? <laughs> it was 300 bucks. Oh, my goodness. It was 1983. Yeah, yeah, but still, quite a bit back but, then, too. Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. And, uh, he, so, and so I'm like, I'm like, and now everyone's laughing and they're partying. Sure. And they're, <laughs> like, having a great time over the death of my bike. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm, like, confused and shattered. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Quickly, George's uh, girlfriend comes out, Cindy. She grabs me. She takes me inside this trailer. Yeah. And it's, like, kind of in the center so I can see everything that's happening. I'm in the kitchen of this, like, old 70s trailer, right? She sits me down, opens up a beer, sits it there in front of me, lights up a cigarette. And I'm going off, man. 
I'm like, what the hell is going on? I'm cussing, man. I'm yeah. going off. I'm like, I'm not going to stand for this. And this dude, George, that I, that I respected, he raised his voice to me and he said, shut up. Like, seriously, it was like a bolt of lightning. He's like, shut up. Yeah. And so I shut up. You know, I'm confused, man. I'm like yeah. blown away. Yeah. They threw some Easy Rider magazines down and they started to explain to me why they don't want Jab Crab and why Harley Davidson is important at that time and uh. American made and supporting mm-hmm. American jobs and all this kind of stuff and explain to me why Brit did that. Oh, I don't know, about a half hour, 45 minutes into it, Brett comes in and he says, what'd you pay for that piece of I was like 300 bucks. He threw 300 bucks on the table. He said, don't do it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he walked out. Yeah. Now I'm 15. Yeah. I got a picture of me tattooed when I'm 15. I'll have to show it to you. Oh, please do. And uh, this dude's massive, yeah. massive biker guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Made his big old bagger look very tiny, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, about a month after that, uh, they started you know, hey, man, you're going to get a bike. You're going to get a bike, you know. And, yeah. But there was no Harley store around there. So you had to know someone that had bikes, uh-huh. you know. The connection, yeah. So there was this old nomad. His name was Lee. Typical looking biker, you know, all lean with a, you know, ponytail and beard and stuff. And he was at that party that night where they destroyed my bike. <laughs> And uh, shattered my dreams. so he yeah. took me, yeah, shattered my, fire, shattered my biker dreams. Yeah. You know? yeah. and, out of love, uh, out of love. Yeah. Out of love. It's a hard lesson, son. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, he takes me over to this guy's house and this dude's like the machinist, right? Mm-hmm. He's like the mechanic for everyone around there. Jeez. And uh, inside his garage, he's got like this machine shop, tons of hot rods and bikes. And he's the kind of guy that just likes to be left alone. Yeah. And, um. I bought my first Harley from him for twenty five hundred dollars and an arm sleeve, and uh, it was a nineteen seventy four cubic inch seventy four shovel head on a rigid frame Springer front end mm-hmm. suicide yes. shift. Oh, it's almost like what I ride now because I yeah. I have one like that now. You have a suicide shift still? Oh yeah, uh-huh. yeah, cool. and uh, and yes, it's a pain in the ass to ride. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but the people that know know, and they're like. Oh, that's the man. <laughs> that's the only reason why I got it, you know. Oh, yeah. That's the guy right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, ugh. um, and that was it, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's pain in the ass yeah, to ride. Don't call man. it like a pony shift. It's a suicide yeah, shift. Suicide that's very shift. inconvenient. The shift there is funny to be though too, because you go from like this jaff crap, but then to like one of the hardest. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. So it was like, yeah. All right. Well, hey, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come back bigger than ever. Though. <laughs> yeah, I love that about it, though. Well, that was all he had, and by the time I learned how to write it, which took me about a month, it was trash. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh man. <laughs> I mean, I wrote it for a long time, but, um, and that was it, man. So you know, I did my arm sleeve on him. His name was Jim, and um, I started writing choppers. I turned 16, mm-hmm. and then all those guys asked me to go to Sturgis with them. Yeah, and and that's that's a. I'm actually writing a book right now about my life. Really, and so all these stories are going to be mm-hmm. in the book. It's called Outlaw Tattooer. I love it. I love and that. Um, I've spent the last year collecting a bunch of photos and trying to find out if I can use some of these photos because I was a member of a motorcycle club for a long time. Yeah, and so I'm trying. It's a book about myself, but I'm not trying to insult anyone. Yeah. Or uh, offend anyone or anything like that. So yeah. it's a process. I thought I was just going to be able to jot stuff down and yeah. turn it into this book and stuff. But but now you're like, if I say this about this particular incident, is someone else going to get yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. So I need to take a little bit more time and do things the right way yeah. as opposed to just getting it out there. Besides that, I think I got like two books now. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now you... You moved to this area in the 90s, 91? I moved to Bellingham in 1988. Okay. Hmm. And you opened your first tattoo shop here. How long after you moved here? Well, I wasn't able to open up a tattoo shop in Bellingham. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bellingham had a city ordinance. And there had been tattoo shops here before, but none of them last very long. Uh, I'm not sure if the city shut them down because of the ordinance um, or if it just didn't work or... You know, no, I agree with you. I mean, I see that all the time. Been growing up here my entire life. It's like 
you'd see it and then it's gone or it's changed the name or changed hands. Right. So when you said that one guy in Arizona still had his shop, I was like, that's that blew my mind. I was mm-hmm. like, that's wild mm-hmm. from when you were seven. But yeah, yeah, it must be a thing around here. Um, so I tattooed out in Blaine for a while. Remember the old porn store that was out in Blaine? I didn't uh, frequent yeah. the old porn <laughs> store out no. in Blaine. No. I don't remember that, man. I know, no. but I know it well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> since I moved yeah. here, we've had the internet since yeah. I moved this area. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the place to be on Thursday nights, I'll tell you what. Okay. Yeah. Fun, fun fact, my grandfather in Blaine owned the porno theater. That was like <laughs> my family's legacy. Wow. By Joe, was it? <laughs> but it was, yeah. The Sea View Theater. Yeah. yeah. No way. The one that used to be on the water there. Yeah. 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 My shop was next to that. No way. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my grandfather, my mom uh, would clean the aisles and. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you dear. Know. I'm this is taking so a much. turn, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. No. <laughs> I never went in there. Yeah. No, no, no. I never did. Yeah. So you opened a tattoo shop next door. <laughs> yeah. Opened Sorry. a tattoo shop next door to that and a barber named Reggie. Super nice guy. And uh, and then I just worked my way towards Bellingham. Yeah. You know, so me and a friend of mine, uh, Kevin Rigador, who's no longer with us, um, me and him opened up a shop with another friend of mine. His name is Jeff. Uh, old school tattoo, and we were on the guide. It's now a Baptist church. Oh, for real? And w- we were right down the road from Extreme Tattoo um, that was in Laurel. Mm-hmm. You remember Extreme Tattoo? I don't, yeah, but I remember old school. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, finally we got into Bellingham. Mm. Old school ta- It's still there to this yeah, day. Yeah. It's the, on like their fifth or sixth owners, but yeah. it's still there. Yep. Um, and so... Uh, but yeah, that was ninety five, I believe. Crazy. Downtown. Yeah. So you've been tattooing for a long time. I mean It depends on how you look at it. Sure. D- different mm-hmm. people look at it differently. So I say nineteen eighty. Uh-huh. Because in nineteen eighty I was doing a lot of tattoos. Yeah. Professional tattooing, eighty three. Okay. Um a lot of people might call me a scab vendor or a scratcher because I was a, or what they call a kitchen wizard because I was just, <laughs> I was just doing them out of my house and trying to learn. Believe it or not, a lot yeah. of tattooers, a lot of great tattooers learn that way. You I know? bet. So, you got to start uh, somewhere. You got to start yeah. somewhere. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I usually say I started tattooing about 1980. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's, what's, if, do you have a particular... Like um, art that you like to do with it, like you know, style. Ink, ink gets big. That TV show or what have oh, you. Oh yeah, yeah, being like most Americans who have, have watched that show, right? Um, like American traditional, or I mean, what is your style per se, or and or the one you enjoy the most to do? Um, so, uh, growing up in the era that I did, it was just American traditional, mm-hmm. a little bit more modified rendered out a little bit more artistically yeah. than the old sailor stuff from the 30s and For 40s. Sure. Still my most favorite art to do, though. My most favorite style is American traditional. I just think that they look like tattoos, bold black outline, black yeah. shading, a little bit of color, some skin tone. I totally agree with you. Um, I just think that they're simple. They convey a very simple message. Um What's funny is that the more artists that get into tattooing, they have they have trouble mm-hmm. with American traditional. Really? Yeah, because they're artists, and so they always want to do something better. They want to do something else to it. Yeah. The art of American traditional is just doing the piece well. Yeah. And leaving it as it is. You the know, way it should be done. And I think that, and well, because I grew up, that was all the flash that I had to look at. So. Mm-hmm. One of the books, I'll say Spalding and Rogers again. It was a 70s edition. Spalding, Spalding and Rogers supply catalog. Don Nolan, who's no longer with us either, big name in tattooing. Um, he had a bunch of flash pages that you could buy in these catalogs. I still have the catalog. It's yeah, in my shop. Yeah, I used awesome. to go to bed with that thing every night yeah. just looking at all the flash. And I'd order Is flash. It worn? It's pretty warm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's leather. More, more than the Playboys that were in my head, <laughs> yeah. you know. I was looking at Flash, you know. But, um, you know, and then later I found out, well, Don Nolan was just 
redrawing all the stuff from Sailor Jerry and mm-hmm. and all these really nice uh, sellable pieces yeah. of Flash. Mm-hmm. And so um, I didn't have any other options. There was no other options. That was it. That was it. And so I just did American Traditional. What's funny is that I can't, when I'm in a tattoo shop, I just think tattoo. Mm-hmm. So if you come inside the shop and you, you're like, hey, man, I want this really nice, rendered out, beautiful piece. I can't do it. Mm. I just can't. I just do tattoos. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So American traditional, I do like Japanese because it's, it basically has the same rules. Mm-hmm. You know? It's just that they were doing it longer and their designs are more elaborate. Yes. You know? And then when I think of black and gray tattoos, I just think of Chicano artwork. Mm. Yeah. Cause that's what I grew up doing. Yeah. So yeah. pretty much like I'm a walk in artist, so I can do anything that walks in to a, to a certain degree. Yeah. But if you want something that's super elaborate, artistic, um, I just, I just can't do it for you. Mm-hmm. So I, I send those customers to other people that can do it well. Yeah. Yeah. It's neat in your shop because you have a real diverse group of guys and now girl, right? You have a, mm-hmm. a handful of them and they, they all have a very unique style to them and mm-hmm. they do some incredible, uh, incredible work. All your guys there. Thank you. I can tell you hold them to a really high standard. Mm-hmm. I've watched you put some of them in their place before because you're like, nope, you got to hit. This is the standard, right? Yeah. I've always appreciated that about, about your shop and faithful tattoo in Bellingham. If anybody's wondering, um, I'm wondering too, man. Great shop. Oh. I was I was pitching the idea of like he tattoos me while we do the podcast. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. <laughs> but, you know the the audio of the buzzing. You know who knows? Oh, yeah, uh, it's the buzzing. <laughs> it's the yeah. buzz. It's the buzzing. Yeah. yeah. Um, believe it or not, man, they they hold me at a higher standard too. Those guys keep me going. I mean, if you yeah. think about my age and how long I've been doing it and how much the world has changed, um, I get worn down really easy dealing with customers these days dealing with younger people mm-hmm. these days yeah. it it just wears me out man you, you know i do my best you're doing a lot more taylor swift tattoos than you thought originally here <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> like but you're okay. drawing taylor all as dog the bounty <laughs> yeah. 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 they'll never know <laughs> they'll never know yeah. yeah no they hold me to a standard man um you know uh we have the practice of everyone that does a tattoo in the shop, they walk and they mm-hmm. show that tattoo to everyone. And then if there's something good, bad, and different, something we need to talk about, then we talk about it before the shop closes. Nice. And everyone in that circle is an equal, you know, so. Um, I love that. I kind of never go home mad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's an explanation for mm-hmm. it. You're not just being, oh, man, that was trash or you could have done that better. I've done my share of trash, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. I've gotten called out on it. Yeah. And so anyone that's going to say there and uh, anyone that's going to sit there and say that, oh, everything that I've done has been, has been great or, or perfect, I'll call them a liar to their face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So. I love that. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, now, mind you, I'm, I'm also older. And so everyone kind of talks to me with this certain Reverence. respect, you know. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. but um, it's really important to me. I don't think I've ever gotten it across, but it's really important to me that in the shop we're all equals. So you can ask me anything. I'm going to ask you, like, oh man, what did you do there? Yeah. See, because I'm still, I still want to learn. I yeah. don't know everything. You know, I'm excited when, when like. Uh, Kai or Liam, uh, two of the tattooers at my shop, when they do great work, I'm like, oh, man, what did you do there? You know, like, I'm excited. I love yeah. that. You stay curious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think, like, most artists, no one's ever happy with their work. Yeah. I'm never happy mm-hmm. with my work <laughs> at all. <laughs> really? It's hard I hate everything back. that I do, man. Wow. Yeah. And so does everyone in the shop. The tortured artist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, because we see all the imperfections. We see all the little things that, that uh, especially. I mean, I think I think being a great tattooer is being able to hide all your mistakes as you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. It's yeah. true. I like that quote. It should be the that, that's the T-shirt. That's the quote. You uh-huh. know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. I mean, I I I talk that with. 
all kinds of tattooers, and they're like, oh, yeah, man, you know. Yeah. A little shading right there, no one even know it. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my second one, when I went in, uh, I was t- telling a story, and I was, I used my hands a lot, yeah. and I, I saw you just, like, stop, and he's like, you need to stop using your hands right now. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, you know, and I, I could tell that, like, I'm, I jerked it, right? Yeah. And I, I still can't find, you know, where I messed him up on it. But I picture you at night looking yeah. at your I'm like, like oh. was it there? Well, see, and I'll never <laughs> I'll never tell you. Yeah. Because then you'll never stop looking at yeah. it. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Because <laughs> you'll see I it. I did do that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So now to here's this is you know, our our show is based around kind of the side hustles and um I think that you your story and your artistic expression, those are things that it just I love it. I don't get tired of chopping it up with you. Sure. I think the thing that drew me to having you here today is that not only are you doing all this incredible art all day, every day, but then you're going home and you're doing more. Right. Yeah. Um, and the stuff that you share is so unique. It's got, you know, I love your sci-fi stuff. Your, uh, it's just got a real, like an old Buck Rogers vibe to mm-hmm. it. You know, you, there's some really cool um, it's just really, really great pieces that you make. But how does a guy that's drawing all day go home and go? I got more gas in the tank to create more. Sure. Tell, what's that like? Well, the tattoos that I do all day are for other people. Mm. Mm. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And so you come in, you you know, pick this umbrella and. You know, or you tell me you want that umbrella, I draw it for you, and then I go and I execute it, and now you walk away with your tattoo, and I got some bread in my pocket, and I feel really good with the interaction, and I did the best that I could do, but it's still a job. I didn't do anything I wanted to do. Yeah. I did something that you wanted me to do. Yeah. And I love tattooing. Tattooing has been great to me, you know, but it's not... It's not what I do. It's What's in art. here? It's not my art. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> so um, I grew up on comic books, man. I'm an illustrator. Mm-hmm. I'm an illustrator. I don't even like to call myself an artist because I think an artist creates art and you ask questions. Mm. And I think an illustrator answers questions. Make that distinction for me a little bit. Well, you know, uh, let's just say you're over here and you're throwing paint you're you know it's coming out of your heart you're trying to figure something out something that looks good for you and now people have questions yeah. you know what i mean or you're painting a landscape to invoke and, that feeling right to bring something out yeah you know yeah and uh you know now people are looking at it and and maybe they're oh was he looking at a sunset look at that beautiful yeah. sunset mm-hmm. i wonder if that is actually a place or yeah or something you know yeah. something like that yeah an illustrator sells things i think that's why i became a tattooer Mm. as well or maybe i became an illustrator after wanting to become a tattooer it's one and the same it's black lines you're you're selling something so if you think about uh the illustrators i mean think about comic books Mm -hmm. okay i'll tell you about one of my favorite illustrators of all time i think he died in in uh, 2010, his name is Frank Frazetta. Have you ever heard of mm-hmm. Frank Frazetta? Mm-hmm. Frank Frazetta, I don't think was ever uh, considered an artist until way late in his life. He was an illustrator. He did Buck Rogers. He did like Little Abner. He did yep. tons of stuff. As an illustrator, I believe that Frank Frazetta, um, through his... Oh, I don't know how to put it. His interpretation through his, uh, he single-handedly changed sci-fi and what fantasy art looks like today. If you look at the movie Lord of the Rings today Mm -hmm. and you go back and you look at his sketchbook in the 60s, right? Yeah. It's all right there. Yeah. It's It's all right there. Frank Frazetta did it all. And he was an illustrator. He did movie posters, album covers. He even did EC Comics, which is another one of my favorites. But illustrators, um, 
they sell things, they answer questions, you know. Mm. Um, and and I think there's a whole lot that goes into being an illustrator because you got to know typography, mm. you got to know signage, you got to know what sells, you got to yeah. all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And he had it all. Yeah. So I like to say I'm an illustrator because everything that I draw um, has that. Yeah. You know, yep. like I know a lot of stuff that I draw is like old comic book type stuff and sci-fi stuff. And I mean, when I was a kid growing up, Star Wars was huge. Oh, Jesus. You know, yeah. and then Star Trek and all that stuff. It was just the beginning of all that stuff getting yep. on yep. TV, you know. <laughs> now it's oversaturated. It's everywhere. Oh, it's crazy, yeah. you know. <laughs> but, uh, and like anything else, man, like I'm a fan of everything that's vintage and old. Yeah. You know, I'm not too impressed with the Tesla. I like the technology, whatever mm -hmm. have you, you know. But give me an old hot rod, man. Yep. Yeah. You know, and that's the same thing. The old artwork that was done by hand has character. It has flaws. Yes. It has soul. It has yep. heart, yep. right? Now you got all these people making art with AI. Yeah. Bro, you didn't even make that. Yeah. yeah. You talked into <laughs> a computer. That you looks like. Commission that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. pretty much. So. I, I have no interest in anything that looks new. Mm -hmm. And so when I get done tattooing all day, I go home and I sit on my iPad. And I never used to, I, believe it or not, this old guy was the first guy in the shop that had an iPad. Really? <laughs> but before I'd have my, my art table and stuff and I would do everything on Illustrator board back mm -hmm. in the day, mm -hmm. you know. But now I sit on my iPad, man, and I just draw whatever comes to mind. Whatever. Yeah. So like... So, last night, did you see everything I put on my story last night? Um, I saw some. Of, I saw some of it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, oh, what's his name? Shepherd, you know, Obey oh, Giant. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Shepherd yeah, yeah. Fairly. Yeah, Shepherd, Shepherd Fairy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the best. Man. I love that guy. So I watched a documentary yesterday. Obey Giant. Yeah. So good. And so, and and I got it. I hate that he's so political. Sure. Uh -huh. I sure. do. Yeah, me too. me too. You know what I mean? I just, like, I get it, man. But whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you turn me off, bro. But <laughs> but uh, I love that everything that he did to, to begin with was so simple. It was so, so simple. raw. So simple. And so, of course, you know, I'm sitting there watching that. I get on my, I get on my phone, man. I find a picture of Chewbacca. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Turn it I black and that. white. Right? Yeah. Turn it black and white. Like that Andre the Giant yeah, thing exactly. that he did. Yeah. Right? And and then so I make something like that and I put rebel. Yeah. Because Chewbacca was part of the Rebel yeah. Alliance, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, and so there's Rebel. And so then I did it and it was a little bit too artistic. And then I did another one and then I did another one that looked like the Obey thing. And then I drew a fist. Yeah. And so that fist that I drew that yep. said rebel underneath there or rebel, uh, I drew that in like a half hour. You do, do you do that while you're watching things? You'll draw? Yeah. 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 It's okay. kind of just, you know, cause this never stops. Yeah. Yep. And so you just keep it going, man. Yep. You know, so I love that. life is short, man. You only have so much time to yeah. conquer this body of work that's inside of you, I think, you know? Yeah. And the more you create, the more these, you're going to break through walls and you yep. gotta, you gotta just overcome and keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So, um, and so, yeah. So I watched that documentary and then I was just like, I'm going to draw some stuff like that. Yeah. Really quick. <laughs> yeah. And I did. And then I was like, cool. now I'm done. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Got that out. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Got that out. You, um, you do a lot of like, um, like I saw your Lords of Gastown yeah. piece that you did. So you have a lot of biker art as well. I do. Sci-fi. Yeah. Some pinup art. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's such a cool body of work that you put together. Um, I'd say it's PG-13 though, you know, so if the kids are going to hop on there, you know, <laughs> yeah. just yeah. check it out. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Yeah. Um, we'll put the, we'll put the link to your Instagram in our okay. show notes so that people can click on it and check it out. Cause I, created, think yeah. I want people to be able to see. Yeah. What did you create? Sure. I think when you, when you're always creating, like I know a lot of artists that are always starting pieces but never finishing them. Mm -hmm. Oh they yeah. Get in, they get too cerebral maybe, or they get too in their head. Like 
it's not turning out the way I want it to. And so they just sit on it. You know, what, what advice would you have for people that are creators to kind of push through artist block? Hmm. Oh man. I mean, I do that. If I'm stuck on something, I just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I have pieces of artwork that are 20 years old that aren't finished, Mm. you know? And there are some of those pieces that are 20 years old that I have gone back and finished. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think because most artists are always trying to push their boundaries. Like if you're always trying to do something and stay comfortable, give it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. You know what I mean? Like if you're trying to do it for fun and, and that kind of stuff, I I get that. Mm Mm-hmm. But if you're telling the world, I'm an artist, you know, yeah. I'm an illustrator, I, 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 I want a voice, you got to push it, I think, yeah. you know. So I think sometimes you hit a point where you're just, you can't think about it or you don't have the skills or you don't know what to do and you just push forward, mm-hmm. you know, stop looking at it, move on to something else. Mm-hmm. You know, but but keep it going. As far as as far as getting stuck on a piece, I think you just keep moving forward. You know, yeah. I know I know a lot of artists that have several pieces that they're working on at the same time. Yeah, um, one line at a time. One line yeah. at a time. Yeah, you know, uh, have other hobbies for sure. You know. Um, seek out other artists for sure, something that inspires you. You know, mm-hmm. everyone's copying everyone for sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're all inspired by someone else. So um, step away, go do something else. Let yeah. your mind rest a little bit. I think most artists are just spinning and spinning yes. and spinning, yep. you know, and especially now with social media and everything. We never stop. We never stop. You know, go camping, go do something, yeah. walk away, you know. As far as not being not as far as like not wanting to create anymore, you know, at my age, I've been through that a couple of times, especially with tattooing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, I think you just gotta use that time. If you can't create, I think you gotta use that time, and uh, maybe. Uh, I know I went through I, I went through a, a really hard time creating and uh, I quit drinking. Mm. You know, yeah. I got a little bit more uh, into my spirituality, yeah. and um, stepped away from a little bit. And then when I came back, I came back, yeah, hard. Yeah, and you new know, focus, a new vision. Gosh, that's such a good you know? answer. But uh, I, I I'm also a believer that if you're stuck on something. Um, there's a reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. maybe subconsciously you're thinking about something that you're neglecting. Maybe Mm -hmm. it's yourself. Yeah. You know, maybe you did something or maybe something or someone did something to you that's chewing you up in the back of your mind. Because I know for me, when I'm creating artwork, I'm just thinking. Yeah. Constantly thinking. And it's not even necessarily about what I'm creating. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The mind's always spinning. So... Um, so something's stopping that those gears from moving essentially is kind of what mm-hmm. you're getting at possibly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know like, yep. uh, you work out a lot, you ride bikes, you work on bikes, mm-hmm. uh, you take Rita out to lunch all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, those all seem like things that you do to kind of pace yourself a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think balance is important. We all, all have these relationships, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Here's this thing that I thought I created, but. I later found out that they teach it in business. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my life, right? My life is this circle. This is everything I'm in control of. This yeah. is my life. Well, you know, all your interactions and all your relationships take from you, right? So now I'm in a 17-year relationship with my beautiful wife. Yeah. That takes up a whole lot of that circle. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, I so, I have to, I, so I have to balance that. Yep. All my relationships with everyone in the shop, now my circle's getting smaller and smaller. There's less control that I have over my life because all these people are taking up a little piece. Yeah. You know? And so you can get super frustrated over that, abuse people, uh, 
high anxiety, uh, abuse yourself, yeah. all that kind of stuff where you can just try to step back, maybe let some people loose, mm-hmm. turn some things loose that mm-hmm. aren't that productive for you, and um, and concentrate on the things that you can balance. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. I quit drinking. I quit drugging. And uh, I started working out, and I started focusing on the things that are really important. With that, I got really creative. Yeah. Mm. With that, right? Yep. And so, um, I think less is more in mm. life. You know, what's the most important thing? Yeah. You know, your life, your you you doing your job in life. Yep. Right. Yep. You know, what is your job? Well, I'm a man. I got to provide. I got to protect. I need to, um, you know, all these. Just depends on who you are, right? Yeah. But there's balance there. And you have all those hats that you're already wearing. It's like to add drinking and drugs or whatever. It's just another hat, another hat, another stress, a smaller part yeah. of the circle. Yeah, and they're not productive. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, how many guys, how many guys do you know that are spending day after day after day in the bar drinking away all this money, yeah. just sitting there, right? Yep. Even and they're then they're sitting there with their friends or coworkers. It's a great time. Mm-hmm. But at the end of that, when you've spent 60 bucks and five hours in the bar or over the campfire mm-hmm. every day, yeah. how productive were you? Yeah. What did you actually get done at the end of that? Yeah. And when it did, did you grow from that too, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, what did it contribute to your life? Yeah. What did you contribute? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. God, I love that. Yeah. I'm saying I love this a lot because I love to over here. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I learned it all the hard way, trust me. Yeah. Trust yeah. Me. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Life tends to do that. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Unfortunately. Yeah. You know, pressure makes diamonds, right? That's, oh, yeah. That's unfortunate. Chu, I appreciate you being here, man. And, and I'm, I just love, I just felt like you brought some real nuggets of truth for us to share with our people. I think, you know, we're talking about doers and creators and, and so many people, I think, get hung up on before they even get started. Right. They haven't let the ideas out of their minds. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I'm just kind of looking as we wrap up our time, I'm looking for, you know, what, what advice would you have for someone or that just hasn't taken that step to create, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to, you know, take a risk with their art. You know, I met a, I met a really talented kid the other day and we sat and talked for a long time and he's very talented musician made some incredible stuff but is scared to perform you know wants to do that so bad but is really scared to put himself out there Mm -hmm. and i think about all these people that are maybe sketching or drawing but never shared that with anybody you know what advice would you have for somebody to to kind of help them i think it just goes with life man i think if you're afraid to fail you're never going to go anywhere Mm -hmm. yeah people that are successful fail constantly they probably fail more then they are successful yeah. in anything that they do. I think, and that is the, that's the the key thing you got to remember. I've failed so much in life. You just keep going. Mm-hmm. You just got to keep going. If if you're afraid to do something, why are you afraid? Mm-hmm. You're gonna fail. Yeah. yeah. So get really comfortable with failing. Yep. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Big you and know, small. Like you're afraid. Well, to me, fear is like a cancer. Mm-hmm. You know, it starts right here and it just chews you up. You know, you got to ask yourself, what are you afraid of? Mm-hmm. You know, you're afraid someone's going to laugh at you, laugh back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, uh, just do it. You you have to experience everything. What, what What's that saying? What's that saying? I'm going to, the bikers have like, uh, you know, when I die, I'm going to crash and burn. I'm going to crash all the way into my grave. You know, I'm not going to arrive safely with mm-hmm. no yeah. stories and stuff. Yeah. That's it, man. I would tell you, musician friend, get out there and do it. Yeah. Give it your best. And then from that, you're going to learn mm-hmm. about what you need to do for the next time. You can't guess on that kind of stuff. Yep. You know, it's all about experience. Yep. Get up there, do it. You failed. Cool. Yep. Well, now you know. So now you got to prepare. Go do it again. Yep. And eventually, you're going to get better. Absolutely. Yeah. You're going to get better, you know. There was uh, someone that worked for us for a while and this person just just really didn't try that hard 
that's what I got from it. But after like two years, they were they were in this spot that anyone that was just standing around in two years would be. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And they just couldn't get what I was saying. I was just like, if you try just a little bit harder, if you put yourself out there just a little bit more, Mm -hmm. you'd be farther along. You're so worried about having this persona already with no experience. So inside your mind, you've already succeeded. You're already this great person. You already have like a million followers on Instagram. You're doing all this stuff, but it's all inside your head. You have to gain all that experience through failure. Yeah. And through success. Yeah. And with that, you, you gain all these things that a person should be. Like, you, you, like you're a little bit more humble. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're a whole lot more grateful and thankful. Mm-hmm. You just don't get success like that. Then you don't know how to deal with it. Yep. You don't, have, don't know how to steward it. Right. So, yeah. so I would just say that. I would say don't be afraid to fail. Just keep pushing. Yeah. Always forward. Always forward, one step at a time. That's right. One line at a time. Yeah, one yeah, line, at, line a at a time. I love, yeah, that's I love it. it. Chew, appreciate you, man. Thank awesome you for much. being on Absolutely, here. Absolutely, yeah. I enjoyed this it. This did not suck. So yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, <laughs> we're so true. glad to have you, man. We yeah. gotta have you back. Yeah, so, I'd love to come back. You know, it's what you said was, I mean, it's so indicative. I mean, I've I've had this written down for years, and it was just pulling the trigger to get started, uh-huh. right, to do something. And I'm just taking that today as I'm thinking about all the things you shared. I think, man. You just yeah. got to put yourself out there every once in a while. Sure. So I appreciate you bringing that courage to the show, man. Absolutely, Absolutely yeah, man. This is Thank you. Pleasure, dude. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've had a great time. <laughs> all right. That's all we got. All right. Thank you so much. Word to your mother. <laughs>